job. An office job would be nothing for me at all, just sitting inside all day. I'm really glad to be outside. I've always wanted to get things moving, and there's plenty moving here. You've got to get the feel for it, and we do the rest with brute force and crowbars. We've brought the thing together to within 10 centimetres and with a 2 centimetre gap at top and bottom. We create things, and out here, as you can already see, we build big. Near Geildorf in the district of Schwäbisch Hall, the world's highest wind turbine is being built. The more ambitious the construction project, the larger and more special are the machines needed to carry it out. The construction of wind turbines without the use of huge special cranes. Unthinkable. Pan a little to the right, swing to the right. Cranes are specialists for lifting and lowering huge loads. The crane operator often works blind. The rule is, listen rather than look. He's not allowed to do anything without a command. That's the first thing. So above all, when people are standing there, he's not allowed to pull or swing at all. Everything has to be done on command. In principle, the crane commands are hoist, lower, operate boom, raise boom and swing. Yes, well, there's also slow and fast, of course, so if you need to be careful or it looks a bit dangerous, then you swing slowly and you raise and lower slowly. So you always start from the crane. Wherever the crane is, you turn your back to it and then you say swing left, swing right. What sounds so simple requires considerable skill and total concentration on the part of the crane operator. One lapse in concentration and the damage is great. The load can come off downwards. Damage, personal injury, material damage, anything can happen if you don't pay attention to it and if you don't do it calmly. And if you make any movement too fast, it would smash the half shell to pieces. Or you might just tear that thing back there right out and the scaffolding would come down and there are people in there. You can't do that. Now it's the last 10 centimetres he wants now, or the last five, I don't know. Don't lose concentration now. Crane operator Ralf Karas skillfully brings together the parts that weigh several tonnes. Millimetre work on the joystick. Swing slowly to the right. Take a look for yourself. We've brought the thing together to within 10 centimetres with a 2 centimetre gap at top and bottom. The Swabian wind farm is aiming for a hub height of 178 metres for one of its towers, 14 metres more than the previous record holder from Rhineland Palatinate. So this is about setting the world record. This is a prototype tower, so we as a team are building it for the first time. Other turbines are easier to build, but with this one it's all new and we have to speak to the construction management or the project management specifically and sort out which cranes we need and then we order them. When I order that crane it's because I need the final 94 metre height of this concrete tower so that it can still get the weight of the adapter up to this height. I need the 11200 for that. But there is a smaller one, the 1750, but it would be too small for this tower. The benefits of the LTM 11200 9.1. With a total of four towers, it's also the first choice for this project from an economic point of view. With this crane, we can also move very quickly from turbine to turbine. Moving times of up to four hours are possible. With other cranes, we need much longer. 
With the LTM11200, moving times are very fast, and we can also install the wind turbine very quickly. We can also install a tip, and with this tip, we can also put up higher concrete towers than with conventional cranes. Even without such lattice extensions, it's the longest. More precisely, the longest telescopic boom in the world. The LTM11200 holds this record in the mobile crane category. The highlight, its mobile base has a road permit for trucks, but without its various attachments and add-ons, of course. Not every step in the construction of a wind turbine requires the superpowers of the LTM11200. Work on the ground could also be carried out by smaller versions, but in the end, it really is the size that counts. This is the largest telescopic crane in the world on wheels. What's extraordinary is the length of the boom and the fact that you can still lift such loads. The LTM 11200, a super crane. No wonder it was named after an ancient superhero. This is our little Hercules. My colleague gave him the name and I don't mind. The entire wind power project near Schwäbisch Hall comprises four gigantic turbines. Among them are some that seem to stand on huge concrete foundations. It's not actually the case, but more about that later. Being mounted on the concrete tower will bring the total height of the future wind turbine up to 240 meters, all made possible by Hercules. This Hercules crane, this LTM11200, has built this active basin here, this tower. And you can see that these are individual rings which are always assembled from four prefabricated shells down here on the crane platform. And they were then lifted up into the construction area, and so this tower grew relatively quickly. But even then, Hercules quickly reached its limits. Another type of crane took over the task of achieving the desired tower height. This Hercules crane is a jib crane, and a jib crane always needs a certain outreach. So the higher the structure gets, the further away the crane then has to stand, of course, and the larger the crane footprint has to be. With this tower crane, we can always grow in height on a constant surface. The specialist used here, a self-climbing tower crane. The top section pushes itself up hydraulically. Then the crane pulls the next lattice segment up parallel to the tower and places it in the resulting gap. Of course, at some point the limit is reached. You only have to think of the hoisting cable, which of course has to have a sufficient length. And of course, I need this crane to be able to climb only a certain height freely. So at some point, I have to anchor it again somewhere. And to do that, we need, uh, let's take our hybrid tower here, which is a concrete tower that's braced into the foundation. And when this tower is braced, so to speak, then this crane can attach itself to this tower again and then climb freely upwards again at a certain height and can then operate. And if at some point I can no longer anchor against a tower or against anything else that's stable, then of course the limit is reached. Self-climbing, an invention to aid reconstruction after the Second World War. The self-climbing crane principle was patented by Liebherr in 1957. Back to Hercules. The powerhouse also has a job on the side as a passenger lift. The fitters don't climb up to their lofty workplace on foot, they float up. No fear of heights. That's a basic requirement for the fitter's job. Here too, the rule is safety first. No work without complete protection. They wear a climbing harness, that's a full body harness with leg loops and everything, and if someone falls, goes down, they're hooked up anyway. After a few minutes flying time, the fitters reach the current tower height of 57 meters. Stop. 
The rope from the rescue set is as long as the tower itself. It is then lowered inside or outside the tower, and then they're lowered down. If something were to happen, a thunderstorm brewing up quickly, or if the crane broke down or something, then they can rescue themselves. The tower team has reached its workplace. Now it's up to the ground team to make the next rings to keep up the supply. Hercules and its crane operator in constant use. It's going in like this, right? Do you want to put it in here? Yes, the other A5 too, right? The other A5 a bit to the right. I trained in the GDR on a truck-mounted crane, which was called ADK-12-5. Then on a caterpillar and on an excavator, because that was the profession of construction machinist and or construction machine operator. And we did the Class II driving license, the truck driving license, at the same time. The cranes in the east were much smaller. Some of them were lattice masts with 40-meter jibs, but with all this computer technology and everything else, it's all changed completely. The machine now takes over the necessary calculations regarding the interaction of height, load and angle of the jib. Swivel round. In the end, however, the fine-tuning is left to people. Perfect job. The half-shells fit together like a zipper, but why do they have to be red? When the sun comes from there, some planes can't see the tower, and that's why the ring is red. It's at a certain height, and that's why it has the protrusions in it, because red lights still have to be put in. These are aircraft warning lights that flash at night. These are the ones you see everywhere at night, on the mountains, and they normally go in there, but they haven't been delivered yet, so they'll have to be installed afterwards. And you don't need the lamps during the day, that's why the ring is red. So there you see, the iron rods are inside, which are inserted from above, and then they're fixed with wire, so that when they're pushed together, they'll all stay in place. From now on, real manual labour is needed. With the hydraulic press, the foreman pushes the concrete shells, which weigh several tons, the last few centimetres towards each other. Until the two half shells fit perfectly together. René Kerner fixes them in position with giant screws. He tightens them with a torque spanner to the nominal torque of 500 Newton meters. All done. To finally join the two half shells together, the construction professionals use concrete. There's a small opening in the construction of the half shells that's intended precisely for this purpose. To fix the half shells together, the tower builders use a very fluid, rapid hardening concrete. The grouting concrete cannot leak out because a joint sealing tape is glued around the grouting packet, the one you see here, and this actually makes the ring 100% watertight. And because the grouting concrete hardens so quickly, there's no danger of it leaking anywhere. Only a few hundred metres away, the construction site for the next wind turbine. It's one of the three towers built on top of a concrete tower with a huge concrete basin into which water will be poured when it's finished. It's a reservoir designed for a water level of 13 metres. The structure is a so-called water battery. The energy will later be generated by the gradient from the mountain to the valley 200 metres below. The actual battery is the water. When we pump it up from the valley, the water is stored here in this reservoir, both in the passive and in the active reservoir. And we then have what you call a potential, and that's up here. 
And as soon as we need water, we release it into the valley and then generate electricity via a turbine. We have 160,000 cubic meters of water that we send back and forth between the mountain and the valley. By using it as a water reservoir up here and as a wind power site, we've used the area twice, so to speak, as a battery or a storage site and as a power generator at the same time. The trend is to go even higher, and here with the 40-metre basins, we only had to build a 120-metre tower on top, and then we were already at 180. So one metre in height is about 1% more wind yield. That's roughly how you have to calculate it. Theoretically, it is simply a question of economic efficiency. Of course, height initially means higher production costs. Theoretically, there are limits to physics at some point, but you could certainly build a wind turbine on top of a 300-meter high-rise. On the first construction site, there are no pools or water batteries. Here, only the tower for the pure wind turbine is being built. In the meantime, the half shells of the red ring have hardened, and Hercules hoists them upwards to a height of 60 meters to their final destination. With every meter of height, the work becomes a little more difficult for crane operator Ralf Karas. Every meter of distance requires a higher degree of sensitivity for controlling the yellow giant. It's not really something you can learn. You've either got it or you haven't. You have to be aware of how long the boom is, and with even the smallest movement, if I move millimetres down here, something moves 10, 20, 30 centimetres up there. And you have to do that calmly and professionally, because otherwise it won't work. When his finger moves one millimetre, the red ring moves many times that distance. Now the tower team is called upon, and they'll need to use physical strength. The perfect interaction between the crane operator, Hercules, and the assembly team makes it possible to put the individual rings of the tower together like pieces of an oversized Lego puzzle. Until finally, everything fits. By the end of the day, the crew manages to put on three more segments to the delight of the site manager. We've now reached a concrete tower height of almost 80 meters. We can attach another concrete segment with the LTM 11200. Then tomorrow morning we will attach this top to the crane and can put up the last four rings of the concrete tower so that we reach a total height of 96 meters. The red colored ring warns low flying objects like helicopters of an obstacle at their altitude. This is a familiar sight to travelers from the Ulm area. It's what the headquarters of Liebherr looks like, one of the largest employers in the region. This 220 meter long hall is the birthplace of Hercules, the world's largest mobile crane. Master of this assembly hall is Markus Frankenhauser. He's the division manager for large scale special crane manufacture. He learned this job from scratch. He's been working for the company for more than 20 years. He trained as an industrial mechanic here and has grown with the crane, so to speak. We're here with the LTM 11200, which is the largest mobile crane in the world. With a total undercarriage length of 22 meters, we're assembling here in the normal position. We produce the device in the supine and the normal position. The normal position here is the way it will later drive on the road outside, and we're currently assembling the engine, plus the cladding, panelling, the splash guard. And at the moment there's an engine being fitted here, a Liebherr engine with a performance of 500 kilowatts. The engines come from the factory in Bull, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. To produce an undercarriage for the LTM 11200 crane, the aim and plant needs 25 days. The Swabians estimate 22 days for the production of the superstructure. This is the point where the cabin is attached, in which the crane operator will later sit. It too has special features. 
The special feature here with the LTM11200 is that it has a so-called swivel cab, and this has to be swiveled right to the back when it's driving, because otherwise the maximum width would be exceeded. The highway code can't just simply be ignored. Sunrise over the Swabian Franconian forest. To be able to work at an even greater height, the men's first job this morning is conversion. The crane needs to be dismantled before it can be extended. A safety device is the first thing that has to go. This is for when you wind up the cable and can't see it up there anymore. It switches it off so you don't pull the hook into the pulley head. It just stops. It's a safety device that's on all the cranes. It doesn't matter if it's the smallest or the biggest. It's taken off because I need it at the top later. We just transfer it. Ralph Karas has retracted the telescope of the crane for the conversion. Other parts that previously marked Hercules' highest point must now be moved to the future highest point. To do this, Ralph Karas first unscrews them. It's just like this floodlight up here for the aircraft and the anemometer. They're all safety devices, and we're moving them because we're making the boom longer now. On the site, everything has already been prepared. The pre-assembled lattice sections lie just a few meters away. They'll then be moved to the end of the telescope with the help of a small crane, fitted on perfectly and fastened into place with bolts. That's the plan. The 25-metre lattice sections are now being installed in front of the jib so that we can reach the lifting height and the final height of the tower and still get the loads up there. And that's why everything, limit switches, wind meters, floodlights, everything is being moved because that will be the highest point up in the sky. Crane manufacturer Liebherr also assembles lattice masts, but in completely different dimensions. The number of lattice elements varies, depending on the height the customer wants to reach and the space available on the construction site. Dieter Meyer supervises the very first assembly of the new crane. Of course, it's always exciting. Yes, I've done it several times now, but setting up this long system is always an interesting feeling. The machine's nerve center is in the crane cabin, the computer. And here I have the so-called setup screen, and the setup screen tells me, or rather, I have to enter which equipment I have currently attached or am attaching. If you see all the abbreviations here, the abbreviation TXX stands for Adjustable Angle System, for example. Then I have my 202T counter ballast here. This area is my support. And based on the entries, I then get my current load tables here, which I can then retrieve and immediately see where I can lift how much load and with which tele length. Today, Dieter Meyer is checking a crane that was ordered with a lattice system of about 100 meters long. The technical term for the entire lattice section is luffing jib. Every piece of equipment is very special, because among other things, they are also sold with different equipment. They're not always sold with the maximum length, but sometimes we get a shorter system, and that's why every crane is special and individual. Each of these devices, which are perfectly manufactured according to the customer's wishes, is completely assembled, erected and tested for correct functioning before delivery. So the first test section went really well. It's like with a car. Every car is the same, but not the same. Each one has its own quirks to begin with, and then we fix them. But that's what we're here for.
Due to the large number of parts that are fitted, it can happen that we have to optimize something at the end on the acceptance test bench. The longer the system gets, the less telly I can actually extend. Where do I have to lift my load? Do I have to lift it onto a high-rise building? Do I have to angle it or can I go straight up? Can I keep the boom straight, etc.? That's such a wide range of applications that the planner then has to put together according to what's needed. Telescopic cranes with extensions are often used in the construction of industrial plants. Though all parts are delivered stacked to save space, the customer is responsible for assembling them on site. The construction site where such a crane will later be used must have a correspondingly large amount of space and level surfaces of the right length. We can now see that we've got the maximum length here. That's what we wanted to achieve. We've now raised it up to the 90 meters we spoke of and will extend this with the NI system with four segments, 6 meters, 12 meters, 12 meters. Reducing head and runner, then the whole system is actually complete. Erecting the crane to its full length is carried out in separate stages. Under real conditions, assembling something like this is not quite so simple. Look, that's what I meant. You take the cotter pin out here, pull the bolt back a bit so that you can fold it up, take it down again and take the strap down again. Because this is where the bolts come in later. They go in there on the side. Go further out, a little further out. The construction site of the wind turbine is in the middle of the forest. Here, the men have to come to terms with cramped conditions. The situation is made more difficult by the fact that the assembly team has not been working together for very long. The men don't know their colleagues well enough yet. The team is not perfectly attuned. In addition, the ground is not completely level, which means that nothing fits together right away as perfectly as desired. Minor slants or tilts mean that the work has to be done over and over again. That takes time. It's already becoming apparent that the assembly team will not be able to keep to the construction management's plan to have the extension in place before the lunch break. But the men have to remain calm and relaxed despite the delay. They know hectic and haste would have exactly the opposite effect. Yes, that's the wrong chain. It's uneven. Let's see if we can get it in. Shortly afterwards, they have to stop. Take it down again. These are the hand signs for crane drivers. We don't need a radio or anything else. Peter! Peter, Michel has to go out again. We have to get my chain in. That one's uneven. It's not the same. Peter, you go in and pull the boom up a bit. Pull the boom up. Peter, it's sitting in the lug. It will sit here when we lower it a bit further. Ooh. After a lot of toing and froing, the job is finally done. Generally, for this work, few words are needed. Communication is mostly non-verbal. The hand signs. Crane drivers don't need to talk to each other much. They just make a bit of a sign and then it all works. As long as it's a well-rehearsed team. But that's not yet the case here. 
and it's a brand new crane. You go down there with the ladder, right? Things are progressing. A little slower than planned, but steadily, element by element. Crane operators don't need to serve an apprenticeship in Germany. Often simple instruction is enough. For example, the academy at the Technical Inspection Agency TÜV offers three-day basic training courses all over Germany. Those interested must be over 18 and physically and mentally capable. Power unit forwards and the press right back up again. Of course, such a crash course is no comparison with the professional's years of experience. But even they were learners at some point. In the meantime, the teamwork is getting better and better. Ralf Karas and his colleagues are well aware of the fact that everything has to be perfect. Otherwise, it won't work. Yes, everything really has to fit. From the lifting gear to the sling, it has to be straight. And you also have to know, for example, what the other crane has to do to get the part into this position. It's in at last. Once again, the men have managed a partial success. At Liebherr, they know how important teamwork is when assembling the huge cranes. The better the team harmonizes and works together, the faster they can be assembled. When everyone can actually rely on each other to do what they have to do, without anyone checking up on them specifically, the easier it is, of course. Watching Dieter Meyer and his colleagues, Assembling the lattice parts seems like child's play. Our customers say we have laboratory conditions here compared to outside. Here, everything fits quickly and easily. These are the so-called laboratory conditions and get it there, clean. Then it could go on like this forever. Technology is definitely advancing constantly, getting better and better. If you think about the kind of steel we use now, and we've been building with this for almost 10 years now. Where it's all going, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that yet. The material will have a say, and if at some point we go to carbon fibre, carbon fibre components, lightweight construction, to what extent that can be realised or where the limits are, I don't know if anyone can answer that. But it is quite conceivable that the Eingen engineers have long been working on developing the next generation of cranes. After all, new inventions and improvements are part of the tradition here. The success of the group is built on the vision of its founder, Hans Liebherr. With craftsmen and designers, he developed the first mobile tower crane in 1949. Within a short period of time, the pioneer small construction company became a construction machinery manufacturer that has been able to maintain its role as world market leader in the mobile and crawler crane section to this day. Incidentally, second and third place went to Tadano Faun, a Franconian company bought up by the Japanese, and Mani Toak from the USA. On the testing grounds around the factory, each of the approximately 1,400 units produced each year has to pass its baptism of fire before it's delivered to the customers, no matter if it's a machine with a lifting capacity of only 30 tons or a giant that can lift 3,000 tons. Meanwhile, the team at our construction site in the forest has also finished. The extensions have been mounted and the telescope, with its new yellow tip, can finally be extended to its full height for the first time. It will then be 125 metres to the highest point. A 
Attaching the additional 25 meters of lattice extensions took more than half a working day. The further the telescope stretches upwards, the greater the force is acting on the lower part of the crane. Of crucial importance on all cranes with jibs are therefore the little arms protruding to the rear that appear rather delicate here. The little arms at the rear are the bracing, and with them I make the boom strong. When I telescoped earlier, the boom was hanging forward. The bracing, back there as it's called, means I can pull the jib in the opposite direction, and this strengthens it, and then I can also move these loads that we're now pulling up to this height, for example. Of course, the crane cannot lift its load up to 125 meters. The height of the load to be lifted must be deducted, as well as the height of the runner and the fixing devices at the top. The maximum load of 1,200 tons stated in the brochure can only be handled by the LTM 1100 under certain conditions. Deploying additional equipment and at a maximum radius of 3 meters. In its current setup with the lattice extension, the maximum load Hercules can lift is 53 tons, but up to the desired height of over 100 meters. Lifting large loads is unthinkable without the appropriate counterballast, and that has to be solidly anchored. So, obviously, the crane is only mobile without ballast and with the telescope retracted. On the road, we move the unit from the driver's cab at the front. All that's needed to drive it is a Class II truck driving license. If we started it now, it just looks like blinking lights, lots of buttons. And a lot of control displays, which all mean different things. Since the crane can pump itself up and lower itself again, you then have level up and down, and then you have some locks in there. Different steering programs to drive a machine this size onto different construction sites, either straight in or completely sideways. Or the front axle steers this way and the rear axle steers that way. The vehicle can be moved at a maximum speed of 75 kilometers per hour. Each crane is painted in a color according to the customer's taste. This colorful vehicle, for example, is going to a customer from Japan. All nine axles of the LTM 11200's undercarriage can be steered separately. Vehicle driver Florian Stur demonstrates some of the computer-aided driving and steering programs. His job as an equipment tester also includes carrying out test drives. That was, for example, driving in circles, the tightest turning radius. When you park or position yourself on the construction site to do crane work or staggered driving, when it gets really tight and you need to get it into a narrow space so that the crane is in the optimal position for its work. In order to be able to do its work, the crane still has to be assembled on site. When it's ready to move, quite a few things are missing. Here, the telescopic boom is missing, because the crane, as it's being driven now, has 12 tons per axle, and that is only permitted in Germany, so it's not allowed to be heavier. And the telescope comes to the construction site on a low loader, is then set down on supports, then you drive under it with the crane, and then all the bolts are bolted for the luffing cylinders and for the telescope, and then the crane can work. A Class II driving license is sufficient to drive the vehicle on the road 
but truck drivers should also be familiar with the technology and know exactly which steering program is most suitable for which situation. In addition, they should be able to correctly assess size ratios. The vehicle is 3 meters wide and 4 meters high, with an overall length of 22 meters. Dimensions are also important for this type of crane. A brief introduction, this is the LR13000, the world's strongest crawler crane. Here it's assembled completely for testing purposes and then delivered to the customer in numerous individual parts. It should be noted that each individual part does not exceed the permissible overall weights and maximum dimensions for transport. That means that each part is limited to a maximum width of 4 meters, the standard length for truck transport, and a maximum weight of 70 tons per individually transported part. Meeting these specifications is the real challenge for the mechanical engineers who designed the LR13000. The result is a gigantic puzzle. The number of its individual parts, however, depends on the future job for which the crane was tailor-made. But we can safely say this much. It can easily add up to 250 individual truckloads. The speciality of the giant crawler excavator is lifting extreme unit weights. The powerhouse can handle up to 3,000 tons of maximum payload, which, thanks to its armoured vehicle-like tracks, it can also move around the construction site. The range of movement and the height to which it can pull the loads also depends on its setup. In its maximum configuration, it can hoist 60 tons of load up to a height of 245 metres. This, by the way, also makes it the highest crane in the world. The colleagues of this giant here are in use all over the world. One, for example, was involved in the construction of the world's largest ferris wheel in Dubai. In Mexico and Pakistan, on the other hand, it was involved in the construction of refineries. No wonder power plant construction is one of its specialities. Unlike the LR13000, which can move along with its load on its tracks, telescopic crane Hercules has to work statically on the spot. Remember, the maximum axle load must not be exceeded. It's only mobile when all extensions are dismantled and the counter ballast is removed. Here in Geildorf, Hercules has counterweights totaling 200 tons. Its maximum load capacity is around 70 tons. There is a basic rule of thumb. About twice the weight of the load to be pulled is needed as counter ballast. This, however, is calculated by the computer. Each of these strong cranes holds its own record in a different discipline, qualities that predestine them for very different applications. The winch winds up the steel cable almost endlessly. It has a total length of 185 meters and a dead weight of 2,120 kilograms. To be able to operate, Hercules has two such steel cables, one for the left and one for the right telescopic guy, controlled by the professionals close to the ground. We now have a tip on the top. This is 25 meters long, and so we now have a height of 113 meters, which means the machine has to be driven even more sensitively because the boom is even longer. Each crane operator is allowed to work for a maximum of 10 hours. Extreme concentration is required on this construction site. But that's why there are three operators for each of these cranes, who take turns in shifts. Yet the trick actually sounds quite simple. Swing calmly, swing very calmly, move the jib very calmly, because otherwise every hectic movement unsettles the load more and more and then bring the loads into position up there in a very still condition, right up there at a height of 100 meters. Genau da oben. 100 meter höher. 
finally, the time has come. A perfect landing in dizzy heights. This shows what real professionals are capable of. Hercules can hoist a maximum of two more rings up to the top with its firmly extended tip. After that, the tower crane comes into play, as it did for the other three windmill towers. The wind farm is scheduled to be connected to the grid in three months. The towers will be completed in a few weeks. We're building something, yes, and we like it. I've been interested in building since I was a teenager. I was a carpenter before that, and then I got even more involved in active building when I studied civil engineering. We create things, and out here, as you can already see, we build big, and that's fun, facing the challenges again every day and thinking about how we can move such big components and how something big then comes into being. Yes, that's fun. And it has really worked. A new world record has been achieved. <laughs>